For at TV, the world is thinking. Now, again, this is a uh, picture of a young Hispanic boy uh, being fingerprinted. That's criminal. It's not a picture of someone who's hungry or homeless or undereducated. And so you're saying that when we talk about children, you want to embrace them all. How do you uh, get that suburban family to say, ah, you know, this kid has been arrested, this kid is truant? Why are you taking everyone in as opposed to the safer cases where there's not a criminal justice, juvenile justice connection? Why are they all included? Again, I think we start back at our basic premise as you know, Judeo-Christian, Muslim, all great faiths say children are sacred. Either you believe they are or they're not. Right. Either you believe that children's lives are all equal or they're not. Um, and so you start from a moral point of view, and then you move to a self-interest point of view, because you've got to walk the street with these children. Right. These are these are the, you know, I, I don't want to be supporting all these children in prison when they ought to be out working and supporting us um, as we, you know, worry about how we're going to sustain our Social Security and Medicare system. Third, it's better to invest up front than to invest more um, and as a result of our neglect. I mean, every dollar you spend to immunize a child is going to save $16. Every child you give preventive and primary health care means you're not going to have billions in hospitalization costs. I mean, every child you don't have drop out of school means you're going to have the chance to have a productive worker who's going to make a stronger economy. And so you make the self-interest argument. Our states at the moment are spending on average three times more per prisoner than for public school pupil. That's about the dumbest investment policy I can think of. And so we lay out the the, the savings of prevention. So you may not like these children, but it is in your self-interest to invest in making them productive workers and people who are valued so that they will value and work for the broader community. And so it's also going to be critical um, to making sure that this nation is able to compete in the new globalizing world in the 21st century. I mean, look at us. And I just I brought one little chart. I give too many figures often. But we've got to reorder our priorities or we're not going to be world leaders in you know, the Chinese and the um, Europeans and the Indians and the Brazilians are doing such better work. And, and, you know, our country loves to be number one in everything. But we are number one in GDP, we are number one in millionaires and billionaires, and we're one in military expenditures and exports. And somehow then we go and we're 16th in maternal mortality rates. We're 21st in our 15-year-old science scores. We're 22nd in low birth weight, 23rd in neonatal mortality rates. We're 25th and our 15-year-old math scores, and this is among all the OECD countries um, that are industrialized nations, most all of whom are less wealthy than we are. We're 27th in infant mortality. We lose 28,000 babies every year. And um, we're last in relative child poverty. We're last in the gap between rich and poor. We're last in teen birth rates. We're last in protecting our children against gun violence, and we're worse and the number of people who are incarcerated. And if we compare black child well-being, just black child well-being, these are all children. 62 nations have lower infant mortality rates, including Barbados, Malaysia, and Thailand. Over 100 nations have lower percentages of low birth weight babies, including Algeria and Botswana and Panama. And black women in the United States are more likely to die from maternal mortality. Um, than women in, in Turkmenistan. Well, we, these numbers are going to kill us.